Hello everyone. This is a kind of a follow-up to my previous video on why websites are slow, or often slow. While I was thinking about that video, I thought about some other things that impact websites, and not necessarily from the slowness or load time perspective. One of the biggest problems I encounter these days is overly busy designs. Now, by that I mean designs where things are flying out all over the place and overlapping other things and popping up in front of the content I want to look at. Uh, one of the biggest offenders is that annoying pop-up box that asks if you want to provide feedback on your experience. Um, quite frankly, the only feedback I want to give when one of those things pops up in front of the bloody page I'm trying to read is, and pardon the language here, is I want to give the fe feedback that reads, get rid of the fucking feedback pop-up. And... I can't be the only one that thinks that. It's so bloody annoying. Don't freaking do it. And even the bloody City of Calgary's website does it. And quite frankly, uh, you, know, you know, I know this is a bad thing to say. There ought to be a law against it. It's just... Well... It's counterproductive. The only feedback you're likely to get from annoying people is your site's bloody annoying. So, yeah. Um, but that's not the worst offender. Um, usually those, when you decline, they go away and they don't come back. At least until the next time you go to the site, which is annoying. Um, so, okay. Uh, I can kind of understand why a site might implement that, at least for a short period of time, especially after they've made some major changes. I could see that. And I, can, I could see my way to uh, understanding why they might be doing it. I still think they shouldn't do it, but that's neither here nor there. No, the biggest offender on this popping out and getting in the way of things are things that pop up when you just hover your mouse over something. Now, I'm not talking about little things in the text where you, uh, you're hovering your mouse over it brings up a footnote or something like that. Uh, usually there's some sort of a visual cue that something's going to pop up when you do that. Um, no, it's the things like you happen to accidentally leave your mouse sitting over top of an ad and the ad starts playing a bloody video. That's annoying. But even worse, you happen to leave your mouse hovering over something like um, a navigation element on the site that doesn't activate instantly, instead pops up after a delay. Well, I might have left my mouse hovering there accidentally. So these things should never pop up on a delay. It should be instant. And it should never, if it's going to pop up on a delay, never obscure the content you're trying to read. Uh, related to this are these things that uh, you scroll the page down and the thing goes, you know, moves with it. Say it's something that's supposed to be glued to the bottom right corner of the screen for some reason. And that kind of site design is bloody stupid, so don't do it. But if, if you're going to do it, don't use JavaScript to do it. Use CSS. And it can be done entirely with CSS. Um, but anyway, what happens if you do it with JavaScript? I start scrolling the page and this thing moves up. When I stop scrolling the page, it moves back down. That's annoying. Don't do it. And then there are things like social media widgets and so on for sharing. And I see this uh, lately uh, fairly often uh, where 
they'll be sitting there, say, on the left of the screen, but there's no margin on the text, and you can't read part of the text because these stupid widgets are on top of it. Don't do that. Make sure that whatever you're doing, you've arranged it so that however you're stacking things, you're not obscuring your own bloody content. Don't do that. And then there's all of the, the sites that have all of these fancy moving, rotating banners and uh, things like that. Now, a rotating banner on the top of the page may make sense, especially on the home page. Um, but it doesn't make sense to have uh, a whole bunch of visually distracting elements down, say, the right sidebar where everything is moving and all of that jazz. And apologies on the camera focus here. I don't know what happened. Um, anyway, as far as that stuff goes, well, just minimize the moving widgets and, and that sort of thing. Uh, minimize the distraction effect and if you're if the thing that's distracting people is ads don't do that uh, a distracting ad is as likely to get me to go away from your entire website as it is for me to click on it um, and I, I almost never click on ads and a distracting ad just pisses me off and while I may not necessarily be in the majority, I'm a non-trivial group. And pissing off people that are actually trying to use your content is not going to get people to go back regularly necessarily. Right. Okay. So things moving around, flying out, videos auto-playing, that's another big annoying factor. Uh, your site should never do anything that makes sound automatically. Um, your site should require explicit action before it starts doing something that makes noise because that is disruptive and it's bloody annoying among other things. So good. Now, granted, going to a YouTube page to view a video, it might be useful for the video to autoplay. But your homepage is not a YouTube video. So almost certainly you shouldn't be having things autoplay with sound. Okay, so that's the random stuff flying around and so on. I touched on things overlapping other elements on the page. Um, oftentimes that happens because people design to one browser instead of designing to the spec. Now, I have found over the, the past decade that if you design and build to the spec, and not the absolute latest spec, but a few specs back. Don't use a higher spec level than you actually need. Uh, it almost certainly works in all browsers that matter. And these days, Internet Explorer 6 does not matter. I don't care why you think it does. It does not matter. And the sooner people stop supporting it altogether, the sooner some of these corporate holdouts will stop using it. Anyway, that's uh, another issue. Um, and Internet Explorer 7 was better on the standards. Internet Explorer 8 was almost there. Uh, and it's good enough that most of the stuff I did degraded to something usable on IE8. Um, now... That brings me to another thing that annoys me about websites is designs that are that only work if they're render, rendered pixel perfect. Don't design something that needs to render pixel perfect. If it has to be rendered pixel perfect, the whole freaking thing has to be an image. That's the only way you can guarantee it's going to render pixel perfect. Um, well, you might be able to if it's a, if it's a mosaic of images. So that 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 should work as well. But you cannot rely on text rendering pixel perfect to what you think it should. Different uh, operating systems 
have different fonts available by default. So using your fancy uh, you, you know, layout, which you've designed around Comic Sans, um, and it only renders properly if, if actual Comic Sans is available, well, you're going to piss off anybody that's on a mobile device, anybody that's on Linux, anybody that's on a Mac, probably. People aren't likely going to have Comic Sans. Um, so, make sure that you're not relying on the text rendering exactly pixel perfect. It's not going to. Uh, even uh, things uh, such as the vertical spacing between lines of text will vary between text rendering engines. So if you care about the spacing between the uh, uh, text baselines, specify it. And you'll find things will tend to have less trouble. Okay, so you have that. Um, make sure that you're not having things arbitrarily overlapping things. That's bad. Uh, so make sure you test it. it test your display in, in different window sizes. Uh, if it works in a tiny window on your browser or on your PC, it will probably work reasonably usably on a mobile device. So, you know, think about these types of things. Uh, but basically, uh, try to avoid locking things down. And uh, try to avoid using so-called responsive designs, because those tend to cause as much trouble as they solve, uh, because they're usually done poorly. Uh, most responsive designs... They still load the megabytes of crap that is associated with the page. They just hide a bunch of it with CSS depending on the size of the screen. And that's a bad idea. Uh, you know, just try to avoid that kind of nonsense. Now, there's a couple other things that cause real problems, and they're even bigger. Uh, one of them is even bigger for a, a certain subset of people. Um, I just encountered this the other day, uh, and that is color choice. Now, some people think it's great to put red on blue or blue on red for a color choice, and that's a really bad idea for anybody, because the focal distance for red and the focal distance for blue are slightly different, so it will tend to vibrate when you're looking at it. Uh, that's actually a physics thing, and it affects everybody to some extent. But that's not the only thing that causes trouble with color choice. When you're designing your website, you need to take into account that not everybody perceives color the same way. There are quite a few variations in how people perceive color. There's everything from average so-called normal color vision, which uh, gives an approximately the same color coverage to all of the normal types. Uh, it's not quite identical, uh, just so you know. So different people really do see colors differently. Uh, so uh, keep that in mind. Um, and then you've got your colorblind types, uh, color deficient types, and there's quite a few varieties there. You've got everything from uh, particular color receptors are malfunctioning and are tuned to the wrong wavelength, to uh, simply not having the third color receptor, to having no color receptors. Okay? Uh, and then, in the other direction, you've got the potential uh, for some women to have four color receptors, which greatly enhances their range of colors that they can perceive. So you've got this, this range. Now, uh, it, it's uh, generally, 
Generally, I find that most sites pick reasonably decent colors. Because generally, if there's a good contrast between the foreground and the background, there's going to be a contrast for the colorblind types as well. Uh, so, uh, one of the best ways you can, you can tell if your, uh, your color choice is going to work uh, is to take a snapshot of it and then shift it to grayscale. If you can still read your text easily, and there's a good contrast between the text and the background, there's a reasonable chance that it's going to work for most people. Uh, however, you should consider also that certain color combinations, which while they might be blindingly uh, different to you, like you might be able to see a massive contrast there, are not going to work for someone who's, say, red-green color deficient. Um, and I happen to be in that camp where I have the deficiency with red and green. Now, it's not that I'm missing that third color receptor. It's just anomalous. It's on the wrong wavelength. Now, at least as far as I've been able to determine, that's, that's uh, the situation. Now... The big thing I encountered just the other day is somebody put something up and it was either brown on red or red on brown or green on brown or green on brown on green or so something in that color range. Okay, And I could see that there was some sort of text there. But that's all I could see. I could not read it. I could see that there was something there, but I could not read it. And that's because the colors were so similar to my ability to perceive colors that they might as well have been the same. And I've seen this occasionally on printed material as well, uh, way, way back, many, many, many years ago. Uh, I actually saw, I think it was, I think it was an Ubuntu uh, CD might have been it was a Linux distribution CD anyway and the dust sleeve on it uh, had uh, colors uh, it, it ha I think it had exactly the same color scheme actually and I could see that there was something there but I could not read it so uh, when you're designing your color choice it's a good idea to go and find somebody who is colorblind particularly the common red-green color blind, and see if they can actually see it, can they, they can actually read it. And if they tell you they can't, take their word for it. Um, it may be blindingly clear to you, but remember, they're perceiving colors differently. Now, if you happen to be color blind and you're selecting colors, the same thing applies because you don't have certain noise uh, or certain perception in a particular frequency range. You're not going to get interference from that frequency range either when you're looking at a scene. Uh, whereas somebody who has the proper perception in that frequency range might actually find that the thing that you can see absolutely clearly disappears in the background. And you can see this with camouflage on, uh, on, on uh, some circumstances, say, where uh, I, for instance, uh, used to wonder how certain camouflage even helped, because uh, to me it stood out like a sore thumb from the background. Yet other people seem to think that it was functional. Um, so, you know, and this is known, uh, in fact, colorblind spotters have been used to find camouflage in the past. So, it's important to consider this when you're des designing your website color scheme. Make sure that your colors are going to work for anybody. Now, certain contrasts, contrasting colors will generally work. So, for the most part, uh, as long as you have I say a darker color and a light color, or a light color and a dark color, uh, you know, 
uh, you know, if you want to switch it around, there will likely be sufficient contrast. So, you know, a light yellow on a dark blue, for instance, probably works, or a medium blue or whatever. Uh, or white on black, black on white. Uh, those are the safe ones, by the way. Everybody can see white on black and black on white, generally. Uh, but, you know, uh, be careful. And if you are a graphic designer, you know, pass the design by somebody who's colorblind. And your eyes might be opened if your design is a bad one. Uh, and it's better to catch it at the design stage when you can still change the color scheme than to find out that it just doesn't work And at the implementation phase when somebody complains that they can't read the site. Uh, you know, really. Uh, anyway, uh, uh, that uh, that's an important thing uh, for accessibility uh, is uh, making sure that your color choice is sensible. Okay, so that's enough with the color thing. Color's a big problem. Uh, so it's, it's actually often a bigger problem than the uh, stuff flying around and the moving distractions and so on. Okay, now fortunately most sites these days seem to have settled mostly on black on white text. And that actually works well. Uh, so, but black on gray, white on black, um, things that have contrast are generally good. Okay, so that's all of the weird animations and pop-up things and floating things and overlapping things and poor color choices. These are big big things that sites these days get wrong. There's one more thing that sites get horribly wrong. And this is basically an outgrowth of what makes them slow as well. And that is using a 400 ton sledgehammer to do something that could be done with a needle. Now what do I mean by that? Well, I see a lot of sites that will load up however many dozens or hundreds of K of JavaScript to uh, lock something to the bottom of the browser window. It turns out you don't need JavaScript to do that. That can be done entirely with CSS. That's right, your style sheet can do it all. Um, the same thing for uh, drop-down menus. Um, if you're doing it based on hovering, you don't need JavaScript at all. Uh, if you are doing it based on a click, which is probably the better way to do it, then the, you don't need a massive JavaScript toolkit like jQuery to do it. The actual code to do it is really quite small. You don't need a massive toolkit to handle a button click. You really, really don't. Um, <clears throat> you know, to have a button click pop up a particular element takes like three lines of code or something like that. It's, it might be a little bit verbose and a little bit annoying to type document dot get element by ID dot whatever. It might be a bit annoying to do that but it does work. And it's clear, it's straightforward, it's fast, and it doesn't bloat your download size to the point that it slows down your web page rendering. And there is the key right there. Um, you don't need separate JavaScript files to do all of that stuff. You can just put a, a short script in line in your template and you're done. And it will almost certainly work across all the browsers. And it will run faster because it's not trying to parse CSS selector syntax like jQuery does. Or anything like that. Now that's not to say that these toolkits aren't necessarily useful. 
there are some things that aren't quite cross-browser uh, friendly, and that's the browser maker's fault, not the uh, standard makers, although the standard makers have been uh, complicit in that, um, uh, by not de designating a proper spec to, to work to. But for the most part, you don't need to be handling keystrokes in your, um, uh, in your JavaScripts. So for the most part, you can use the W3C style coding and it will work with current browsers. Ten years ago, that wasn't quite the case. But anything new done today, you don't need these massive toolkits to get compatibility. You can just work against the W3C DOM stuff and it works. And now I'm speaking from experience here. While it may seem simple and fast to just put a line at the top that loads a jQuery script uh, and then a single line using the jQuery scheme to do your pop-up thing. If all you're doing is that one click here and something pops up bit, well now you're loading that massive jQuery library to do a simple task that could be done in a couple, couple three lines of code. So this is a massive thing that sites get wrong. And by relying on this massive third-party library, you end up with uh, importing all of the bugs in that library as well, and all of the potential problems with it. So, generally, it's better not to use something like jQuery at all. Don't use it. You don't need it. Learn the DOM. It's not complicated. A little bit verbose, maybe, but it's not really that complicated. You're only going to be using a handful of calls for the most part, and then basic JavaScript coding, functions and loops and stuff, and that's about it. And for most stuff, you don't even need, need loops. So, hey, really, learn the basic JavaScript, learn the basic DOM stuff, and you're done. There's plenty, plenty of tutorials out there that give you good information on that topic. So you don't need to mess with this stuff. Now, if, you, if all of the sites out there were to <clears throat> use custom-coded JavaScript for their simple stuff, I think a lot of the web would run faster because there wouldn't be a lot of this extra stuff being loaded. It also means that there'd be less temptation to use something like a jQuery effect to nail something to the bottom right of the browser compared to the dozen or so lines of CSS code that mean the browser nails it there for you and it, you don't end up with weird sliding effects and so on. Right. Uh, so basically... Don't use complicated JavaScript libraries when you don't need them. That's what it's coming down to here. There's one more thing that I want to talk about that sites do horribly wrong. And that's using some sort of content that requires some sort of a plugin to run. These days, the big offender is Flash. Flash um, is dead. Uh, as far as the creator's concerned. Um, HTML5, so to speak, uh, provides alternatives to just what everything Flash does, and it provides alternatives that don't have the massive security problems that Flash has due to the fact that Flash itself is not getting updated, at least on, a on, on the Linux platform. I haven't checked into it recently because, I, personally, I have hated Flash with a passion for... Uh, more than a decade. Um, it used to. It was all the rage for a while to build entire websites as a Flash uh, application, and so you'd you'd hit the site, 
you get some sort of a loading screen that uh, loaded the, all the Flash assets and so on from the server. And then you would click around in the Flash app and the web browser is just serving as a gateway to display the Flash content. And that allowed you to have things flying all over the place and all of the stuff that I, to I have told you is a bad idea. Um, and if you weren't doing that stuff, you didn't need Flash. <clears throat> so Flash got a bad reputation and it deserved it. Uh, most of the content done in Flash in this manner was actually obnoxious to use. Um, and on top of that, the only way to develop in Flash required you to purchase expensive software from uh, whoever it is that made it at the time. And, yeah, and if you happen to inherit a website where you don't have the original source code for the Flash, you can't change it. And that's the problem. Uh, and that's partly why some sites used flashes so that people couldn't actually rip off what they were doing and repurpose it. They couldn't see how it worked. Okay. Um, but you're putting something up there for free, generally. Why are you worried about that? Okay. That, um, that's an excuse for some sites, but most sites didn't have that excuse, really. Um, for a while, it was Java applets that were the big uh, thing that caused problems, uh, but now it's Flash that's lingering. And quite frankly, it can't go away soon enough. At uh, my day job, uh, one of our customers has an old website that has a really, really horrible content management system based on Flash, and it has some serious bugs in it, but we can't fix them because nobody has the Flash source code. And even if we had that, we don't have anyone that can program the Flash stuff. And it's just not worth the effort to try and fix it. Uh, when you could build a completely new website using modern technology and maybe something like WordPress and get something up and running faster than trying to decompile and fix the flash. So, um, using something like flash for your content when you don't actually need to, and you almost never need to, by the way, and that's been the case for a really long time, is a bad idea. Don't do it. And the same applies to Java applets and things like that. Don't use it unless there's a good reason. Okay, so that's where I'm going to leave it for now. I'll just summarize, you know, the things that uh, sites do wrong. It's having a whole bunch of busy things flying around, rotating around, uh, generally being distracting. Having elements that overlap other elements uh, because either the designer was an idiot or it, there was no testing other than in that one browser the designer has or because they're designing toward one browser and not actually the spec. Um, also is color choice. Uh, bad color choices make sites unusable for people. And using technologies, extra technologies that you don't need, like libraries, like jQuery, or things like Flash that requires a browser plugin that hasn't been updated in forever. Right. That's pretty much the biggest uh, collection of the do's, of, of the don'ts out there. Uh, no doubt there are uh, other things that get up people's butt, you know, and generally annoy people, uh, but these are the ones that I've noticed recently, and there's no excuse for most of them. Like, really, there just isn't. So if you're a web designer or developer, and you're coming up with a design to build a, a site around, or to put around a site, keep these things in mind. If you're a coder building a site, 
keep in mind that reaching for jQuery is almost certainly the wrong thing to do um, because it's going to massively overcomplicate things when you don't need to. Anyway, uh, that's all for this particular rant. Uh, if you have ideas for future topics, uh, let me know. Um, be sure to subscribe so you get notified of future videos. And if you've watched this long, thanks for watching.